Peter, our pastor, and we're going to look in, starting in verse 17. I'll go ahead and read the whole passage down through verse 25. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, that, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. So let's, let's look at this portion of scripture this morning. Uh, he talks about treating, how to treat uh, spiritual leadership, uh, your pastor and, and leaders. And he talks about uh, treating them with, with honor. In fact, he uses the term double honor. Now, my theory is this, is that, uh, you know, sometimes we think uh, the pastor is not worth paying too much. You know, so God says that, you, that usually you might think they only deserve half what they should get. So God says, pay them twice what you think they're worth, and that'll be about right. <laughs> no, that, that's just, just my theory, but... When he says treat him with honor, sometimes people use the word reverent for a pastor. Now, the Bible never uses that for a pastor. That, that term is only used for God. It actually means dreadful or terrible. So if you call me reverend, I know what you're saying, all right? <laughs> um, but he says treat the pastor with, with honor. Support him physically, financially is, is one of the things he's talking about. And he quotes there from Deuteronomy uh, 25 and verse 18. He also quotes Jesus. Uh, from Luke chapter 10, when he says, uh, the laborer is worthy of his reward. But you know, a pastor is not there for the money. A pastor who loves the Lord and loves God's word, uh, that's, not the, that's not the motivation. Uh, if you know as many pastors as I do, uh, you know, most of them are sacrificing to be in, in the ministry. Uh, you know, quite often they'll have uh, two or three jobs just to support themselves as they preach the gospel. There's a portion of scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5. And I'll say this while, while you're turning there. Uh, it's odd living in this digital age. You don't hear the, the rustle of pages anymore. But um, 1 Peter chapter 5. There are people in religion who do live for the money. And God warns us about those. And this is, is one passage uh, where he... He uses the term that as a pastor, it's, it's not for filthy lucre. Let me read the whole uh, right from verse 1, 1 Peter 5, verse 1. He says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So Peter is talking to other elders or pastors, and he said he's, he's the same. Uh, he says, And a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So very quickly, he gives some instructions to pastors there. Uh, you know, you, you're not a dictator. Uh, you're not in it for the money. Uh, you're to be an example. And he says that the chief shepherd is, is the Lord. And I wanted to read verse 5 because it really gives the heart of the passage. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And you know, that's the key in the Christian life, isn't it, really? Uh, humility, honoring others, uh, considering others before ourselves. Uh, God says in, in honoring a pastor, uh, we should support him. I mean, the theory is that if you had 10 tithing families in a church, that would support the pastor. That would be enough to support the pastor. But you know, one of the best ways to support the pastor is just to be faithful. Be faithful to the Lord. Uh, you know, we're in this together. Uh, now, sometimes when a church fails or succeeds, you know, the pastor gets the blame or, or the credit. But, you know, a church is, is not just a pastor. It's, it's everybody. 
And uh, if you'll be faithful to the Lord, listen, that'll help your pastor. If you want to help your pastor, uh, the Bible talks there in verse 17 uh, about those that labor in the word and doctrine. Uh, you know, that's, that's a pastor's job. And as Christians, we need to be faithful to the word and doctrine. Uh, respond to the preaching. You know, listen to it. Live what, what the Bible teaches. That'll help your pastor. <laughs> uh, be faithful to your church. He uses a term in verse 17, the beginning, let the elders that rule well. well listen, if the elder is going to rule well, the people need to be ruled. I mean, that's just as simple as, it, as I can put it. Uh, you know, we submit ourselves as part of a, of a church. It'll help your pastor if you'll communicate. Now, if you've never preached, you, you wouldn't understand this, but when you're preaching, you see people with some of the oddest expressions, and you think, what is that communicating to me? <laughs> now, it may be absolutely nothing. You know, they may be having a passing pain or something, but uh, more than just your face while I'm preaching, I need to hear from you. If you've been blessed, let me know. If you've been bothered, let me know that too. <laughs> if you're in the hospital, let me know. <laughs> you know, I don't want to hear the, the week after you get out, you know. I really appreciate it. Now, he's, Peter's not here this morning, is he? I really appreciated Peter. He's, he's been in and out of the hospital, but he's let me know. And, you know, I've tried to uh, keep our church aware of what's going on there. Uh, we're a family. We're a body. Uh, we need to communicate. Uh, pray for your pastor. Uh, Timothy became the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And uh, one of the things that Paul wrote about in the book of Ephesians was praying and praying for, for Paul. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, he said, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You know, you're praying for each other and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. You know, of all the people in the world, you wouldn't think Paul needed to, any more boldness. Uh, what a bold man he was. And yet he did it, uh, you know, beyond his fear. He, he did it in faith to the Lord. And he needed them to be praying for him. Uh, your pastor needs that too. You know, your experience is how your pastor preaches and how your pastor treats you. Your pastor's experience is how you treat him. You know, it, goes, it goes both ways. And, and I, I preach this not just for myself, but I, I won't always be your pastor. You know, some of you are going to move. Uh, someday I'm going to die. <laughs> uh, you know, things change. And you need to have a, a scriptural attitude in, in honoring your, your pastor. But then he moves to another related area there in verses 19 through 21, and that's discipline. You know, and as a church, we have a standard. God's word is, is our standard, and it applies to everybody. It's not just some, it, it's to every Christian. And uh, in verse 19, he says, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Now, Part of this is, is because Timothy, as the pastor of the church at Ephesus, uh, there were people in the church that had problems, that did the wrong thing. It, it could have been Timothy. You know, that can happen in a church where the pastor does the wrong thing. And he's saying that they're not above uh, discipline. Jesus, it just amazes me in Matthew 18 how in just a few verses he explains church discipline. Very clearly and, and very uh, very simply, Matthew 18, verse 15. He says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. And that's the beginning. If you see a wrong, well, obviously you don't get up a committee. You go and talk to that person. If it's not worth talking to them about, it's not worth worrying about. But if you see that it's a sin or it's something harmful to, to them or to the church, and the goal is to, to win them, not to get rid of them. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. See, he gives a process. Then he says, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. See, that's the point where you bring it before the church. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. And in all of this, the goal is to win them back. Uh, to, to see things going right. Um, Timothy would have had to do that in his own church. 
And when he says to treat them like a heathen man and a publican, I, I don't know how you treat heathen and publicans, but I'm real nice to them. I invite them to church. I try to talk to them about the Lord. We invite them over for dinner. And, you know, there's a lot of things. Uh, we don't disdain them or treat them unkindly. And if someone has been in our church and has moved on for one reason or another, uh, we don't treat them meanly. Uh, we want God to, to bless them and, and to help them. Now, that's God's plan for discipline. But in this passage, he particularly talks about discipline involving leadership in the church. Man, that can be hard. Uh, it can be really hard. He just very quickly in verse 19, he says, mainly, be sure of the facts. You don't want to just have innuendo or rumors uh, that are driving this. He says there, there needs to be two or three witnesses. Secondly, in verse 20, he says, be out in the open. It's not something you do secretly, because this is leadership. Uh, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. And then in, in verse 21, he's saying, do it without partiality. You know, sometimes we're, we're more quick to judge someone we don't like than someone we do like. I'm more quick to judge someone who's weak than someone who's strong. And he says very clearly there in verse 21, without preferring one before another, doing nothing by, by partiality. In other words, obey God's word, uh, no matter what. Timothy had to deal with leaders in the church uh, that were out of line. The, the reason I say that is in Acts chapter 20, some of you are familiar with that, it's where Paul was leaving, and he called, the Bible says, the elders from Ephesus, and uh, before he got on the boat, he basically preached a, a sermon to them. He talked to them to encourage them. And in uh, Acts 20, verse 28, here's his, some of his last words to these elders. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. That's the word bishop. And by the way, God has three titles for a pastor. Pastor, bishop, overseer. Same office. To feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And listen to this, verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So that was the church that Timothy became the pastor of. And Paul had warned, you know, there's going to be outside influences, but there's also going to be people from among us, he said that could rise up with false doctrine or, or uh, wrong activities and so on. Uh, Timothy had to deal with leaders in the church that were out of line. Uh, a church sometimes has to deal with a pastor that's out of line. But keep in mind the purpose in all of this. Galatians 6, 1, brethren, um, let's see, I should know that verse. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, that's always the, the purpose in church discipline. And then he, uh, I think verse 22 applies here as well. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. It's kind of a transition here because, you know, if someone has experienced church discipline, especially in, in leadership, uh, he says, lay hands suddenly on no man. Don't, don't just... Uh, coddle them. Don't just overlook it. There needs to be a proper restoration. Uh, you know, restoring someone can be difficult because we don't know each other's hearts. Uh, calling a, a person as a pastor can be difficult. You know, sometimes they can present themselves very well, and, and yet the main thing is what's, what's their heart? What's their beliefs and so on? Uh, so when he, he talks here in verse 22, I think it applies both to discipline and also to calling a pastor or appointing people to, uh, to leadership. You know, it's not always evident what's inside a person. You, you've probably experienced that. And it, I find verse 24 and 25 very interesting. Uh, it, it just really hits, hits it on the head as to our experiences with people. Some people, you meet them, you think, oh, there's trouble. Yeah, their, their sins go before them. Others, you, you might think that and, and they're, they're okay, you know. Some people, you think, oh, boy, they're going to be great. And they're not. Or they are. You know, uh, we see all different things. We don't always know by, by seeing the outside. Uh, but God knows the heart. And that's what, what we're concerned about. You know, God gave the qualifications for a pastor there in, in chapter 3. And the Bible uses the term laying on of hands 
or uh, ordaining is, is the term we might use. And it, it's just saying, we approve of this person's ministry. And he said, don't, don't do that suddenly. Don't, don't do it carelessly. Uh, they need to have a track record. Uh, that's why he says in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6, not a novice. That's being lifted up with pride. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. Verse 7, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. You know, it's no good just having a good report in, in church. If the businessmen in the area say, well, he doesn't pay his bills and you know, doesn't, he's not a good neighbor and so on, he needs to have a good report lest he fall into the reproach and, and snare of the devil. Yeah. In Acts chapter 6, it talks about them appointing uh, deacons. You know, the, the disciples said, pick out seven men that we can appoint uh, to this office. And uh, later in, in chapter 6, verse 6, it says, when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And they said, these, these are the ones we believe God, God has called as, as faithful people. Then there's a verse here in uh, 1 Timothy 5, uh, verse 23. I'm not exactly sure why that verse is exactly here. But uh, I think... Uh, I understand what, why it's there. He says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Uh, let me tell you, every wino in town knows that verse. <laughs> um, he's not saying don't drink, you can't drink water. He's saying don't just drink water. And, and he's saying you can use wine for medicine. You know, the Bible tells us it shouldn't be a beverage, but it can be used as medicine. In those days, I mean, they didn't have the things we have. This, we have too many things, but uh, uh, they didn't have a whole lot of, uh, of medicine, and wine could help. There was times when it, it could help. And uh, I think one of the things he's saying here is, you know, for Christian leadership, you need common sense. A Christian leader needs common sense. Uh, Timothy could use wine as medication. Uh, he wasn't to, you know, the Bible very obviously says we're not to be drunk. Uh, we're not to look on the wine when it's red. In, in other words, we're not to... Uh, make it a, a beverage, but we can use it as, as medicine. And you know, there's a lot of things in life like that where as a pastor or a leader, you can take a dogmatic stand that doesn't make common sense. And you need to be careful. Uh, you don't want to disapprove of what God doesn't. And you don't want to approve of what God doesn't. Uh, we need to have God's mind on that. And he, he talks then in verses 24 and 25 about their reputation. You know, that's, that's so important. Uh, one man calls it, it's, you know, it's where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> you know, what you really are, that's so important. It's not enough just to have the right words to say uh, when you stand up in front of the congregation. Uh, a Christian, and, and especially a Christian leader, needs to live the Christian life. And they need to, to live it properly. In fact, he uses the term in, when he talks about the qualifications, a bishop must be blameless. Now, that's not an impossible standard. He's not saying they've never done wrong. But when they've done wrong, they've gotten it right. You know, where someone can't point the finger and say, he wronged me and never got it right. Uh, a pastor has a, a standard that comes from God and needs to have a, a reputation that reflects that kind of thing. Uh, in Philippians, God talks about a man named Epaphroditus. Not a real common name that people are naming their kids anymore, but uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, he says, I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. And listen to his, his description of Epaphroditus. I was wondering what, what his nickname might have been. I'm not sure. <laughs> My brother, companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. Well, that's a high recommendation, isn't it? And he says about this man in, in verses 29 and 30, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Here is a man who, who lived for the Lord, uh, not just at church, but in, in his, his life, in its entirety. There's another example from John, the, the book of 3rd John. You know, you've got 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 2nd and 3rd are only one chapter. 3rd John, there's a man named Diotrephes in uh, verse 9. He says, Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he do doeth, pratting against us with malicious words and 
not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil. See, this man, he had a bad reputation. He was not good in, in the church or, or outside the church. But in verse 12, it talks about another man. Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. You know, we have a reputation based on the truth of our life. And it's important because for some people, you'll be the only Christian they know. And what a, what a pity it is when uh, your life or my life pushes them away from the Lord. You know, only God knows the heart. We can't look at someone and, and see their heart. Uh, when they were choosing the 12th apostle in, in Acts chapter 1, this was their prayer. Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast chosen. They were choosing someone to take Judas' place. And, uh, you know, there in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, it talks about how we, we just don't always know. We might think, oh, they're going to do good, and they don't. We might think, oh, they're going to do bad, and they do good. You know, we can be quite wrong uh, about people. But he says when he finishes the chapter, they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Now, listen, what we are is going to come out. Be sure your sin will find you out, the Bible says. Jesus said in Luke 12, There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Uh, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 9, he's talking about false teachers, and he says, Their folly shall be manifest unto all men. You know, there's people, boy, they sound good. You, know, they, they, you think, wow, they, really, they can really preach the word, and yet they're preaching things that are not right. That's going to come out. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul said, He that judgeth me is the Lord. You know, he had a hard time. There's people who condemned him for one thing and another. He said, well, listen, I've just got to live for the Lord. He that judgeth me is the Lord. And the key is this. I want to bring the, the whole thing down to this. God knows our hearts. God knows your heart. God knows my heart. Uh, you and I might be wrong about it, but God won't be. God knows our heart. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and, and verse 5, he said, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. God wants us to have a real faith. You know, not just a show for others. You know, that, that's basically what religion is. Religion is putting on a show. Uh, I often get people when I'm door knocking and say, oh, we're, listen, we're not religious. I always say, oh, good, you'd fit right into our church. We're not religious either. Of course, they never know what to say, so they usually close the door at that point. But... Uh, <laughs> You know, religion, God does talk about religion. He says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to, what's the first thing? Help the fatherless and the widows and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You know, it's very simple. It's not a big show. It's not a building. It's not a, uh, you know, a ceremony. It's having a heart that's, that's right with God. Uh, is it real? You know, it's going to affect our church, how you live. But most importantly, it's going to affect your eternity. If it's not real, listen, when you stand before God, he's not going to be deceived. Now, there's going to be those who say, Lord, we did all these things in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me. I, I, I never knew you. See, God needs to, to know you. God does know you. It may not come out in this life. You know, there might be those who say, oh, boy, he's doing great. And God says, no, he doesn't have a heart for me. The Bible says it can't be hid. In fact, in Hebrews, he said, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. We'll stand before God. We'll give an account. Uh, we're to treat people right. We're to honor, honor others. But you know, most importantly, we need to treat God right. <laughs> we need to honor the Lord. And uh, when God says something, we need to believe him. We, we shouldn't call him a liar. Ephesians 2, he says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, it's not right to, to say, oh, I can work my way to heaven. I'm good enough. I'll be all right. If there's a God, he'll like me. <laughs> God says, we're all sinners. Are you saved? The, the next verse in, in that chapter, Ephesians 2, verses uh, 8 through 10, uh, verse 10 says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Are you serving the Lord? 
if you're saved, God made you to, to serve. Are you serving him? Is Christ your peace? Yeah, do you go to him for peace or where do you go? God tells us to honor leadership, but you know the main leadership we need to honor is the, the leadership of the Lord. Now, let me encourage you this morning. You can know the Lord. Now, that's why Jesus came. God manifest in the flesh. And uh, you know, the message has gone out, the gospel, the good news. <laughs> Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again. Victory over sin and death. You can know him. He says, these are written that you might know that you have eternal life. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Uh, I hope that you know Christ today. If you don't, you can't. We're going to sing uh, page 153. It's the song, I Surrender All. Page 153. We'll get Azrael to come and...